bear with me that I have to use a written concept. So at times I'm going to read things out of that. Um, as indicated already, uh, there are political in, um, developments in Europe you are aware of, I think, some of you are. Um, those political developments do tend to um, be based, in my judgment, uh, on some changes in the political perception or the perception of politicians of society, which bothers me more than anything else within that. Um, this is based uh, very much on the difference of two legalistic aspects. Um, the perspective of a uh, Anglo-American uh, law system which very much uh, builds upon uh, the individual's rights and therefore rights of structures of society to self-regulate itself uh, is opposed to a more continental European position which is based on a code of rules uh, which is the uh, originally the Code Napoleon which means regulation is a major issue. Uh, so one can build upon regulation um, the, the new developments. Now, quite logically that means uh, that if there is any change in innovation or uh, any change in technology, you have to change the rules. And as a result of those changes of rules, you suddenly are changing the total legal structure uh, in a legal system. The result is that you are constantly changing the security for business in the legal environment. Um, based on that, uh, we, we're facing now a second effect on that, and that is that suddenly those two systems are increasingly mixing because the influence on legal aspects, um, the intention of uh, large global corporations do impact on those systems as well. And as a result of that, we are seeing a highly insecure environment about legal elements. That is the major reason why some of the changes that were seen in regulation, in my judgment at least, are facing uh, our structure in Europe. Now, as you are all aware, uh, it's a patchwork of nations. There are 27 member states. There are 23 languages, there are 500 million people, and there's one currency for 60% of them, and uh, there is a substantial uh, income uh, of 24,400 uh, euros per inhabitant, but it is spread quite widely. It is spread in, in between 250% of that amount to 40% of that amount, which means that we have a quite a disparity within uh, Europe itself. And if you look at uh, the amount of uh, money that is generated uh, in the business of uh, direct marketing, you will find that uh, there is an increasing uh, number showing up there, which is now well above 100 billion euros for that business, uh, with about 55% of that being in online um, digital uh, businesses nowadays. Um, both sectors, offline and online, are actually growing, but uh, online is outgrowing by far uh, the investment levels. There's also a patchwork of standards. 
there is a major difference in standards, um, and the standards difference um, are developed or have developed over the last years um, because of a form of differentiation within the EU, which is uh, differentiating between a directive from the European Commission and a regulation of the European Commission. That becomes important because a direction gives a set of rules to be adopted by countries and they, these adoption can, or that adaptation can vary quite heavily. So we have the patchwork on data protection and privacy uh, for quite a while and uh, the special regulations on national levels then uh, sets a, a quite um, different level of importance to the uh, data protection and privacy laws. Did do that and as a result of that the European Commission came to the conclusion that they have to rework that part. Now um, why did they have to rework that? Um, I think the, there is an element of innovation uh, in human beings uh, that are um, looked at, can, can be looked at as a life cycle, uh, but not so much the life cycle of the innovation itself, it's the life cycle of us being confronted with innovations. And my daughter basically defined that in a way that I found quite interesting. She said anything in technology that is there when we're born we think is normal. Uh, everything that comes up as an innovation when we are uh, about 25 we think as being sensational. Uh, but everything that appears once we're 40 or plus uh, it's something like almost fatal. And I think uh, there, there is some truth in that as far as politicians are concerned, they are mostly over 40. So they were confronted in a situation where uh, in the years since 2000, basically social networks grew up and became very important. And as a result of that, uh, all regulation work is a post effect work, which means uh, they suddenly realized that their old structures of directive did not work anymore. It did not include the major changes in uh, developments uh, of technology. And so as a result of that, they defined, redefined e-privacy and they redefined um, data protection as a major element of new laws to come. So as of the 25th of January, January 2012, uh, the Commission then finally did propose a new set of regulations for data protection. Now, uh, in principle, uh, one has to understand that any regulation that is put forward has to go through a major um, analytical uh, approach, a political appro um, consultation in, at various stages. Um, this is uh, because those regulations are directly applicable. Uh, so there is no implementation into national law necessary, which means they become law in all member states. And uh, that basically says if uh, the, the moment the proposal would be adapted, uh, two years after it becomes automatically national law, which is under the current um, intentions of the Commission, European Commission, 
2016. Um, the, the one key question then is will all the existing national laws become obsolete because they very often cover more than just data protection issues uh, and therefore they are interlinked with other laws in the country which means there's a whole major pro political process excuse me process necessary to come up with a uh, reasonable legal structure uh, for all of Europe. But nevertheless, this is what the objective is. Now let me talk about the aspects of the reform. And there are uh, a lot of uh, aspects that could be interpreted positively, particularly from the position of the European Commission. Um, first of all, um, the individuals will be put in control of their data. That's the objective. Uh, the second is, and that is the concerning part, one of the concerning parts is data protection rules will be adapted to digital internal markets. The harmonization, which is the third key element, are supposedly bringing 2.3 billion euro savings and the simplification another 130 million savings. There is uh, one element in there which I am very concerned about is there is more independence for data protection supervisory authorities. Uh, those authorities are not elected they're imposed and they are heavily dependent on the EC Commission. The EU, excuse me, EC is the old terminology, <laughs> EU Commission. Um, thereby, um, the Commission itself, who is instated, it, it, it's installed, it's not uh, voted upon, it's not elected. Uh, there is an institution that is setting its own rules and can apply those rules by and in in vigor those rules by another element that is not elected which i think um, puts some question marks on the democratic process of that but there is uh, a one-stop approach for data protection within the european union which is claimed to be the case um, now, when you come and look at that, you suddenly realize that those um, one-stop data protection only applies to those who are in several countries. Now, most of the business that we're looking at is still a smaller and medium-scale business that is not necessarily at this point in time in various countries, most of the time one or two countries only because of the language barriers. So there is an issue uh, of what those benefits ultimately mean. And then there is uh, a more consistent application of the data protection law, which obviously is uh, uh, understandable if you do feel that there is a higher need of data protection. The last thing, however, is something uh, that we all should be concerned about, not just in Europe. It is trying to set global standards for data protection. Now, all these objectives are more or less understandable. Um, some of them are um, debatable. But the real issue that we will see is uh, what the application of the individual uh, set of rules will really mean. Just to quickly go over two elements in there which I already mentioned and there is um, a data protection board which is uh, really done by elect, non-elected individuals, so it will be administrative. 
And then there is the rights of the European Commission, which will be included in that regulation, which basically, the, by the way, this is about 90, more than 90 uh, different articles, um, 26 of which would be defined as being uh, delegated acts. Delegated acts allows the European Commission to change without uh, basically talking to the individual states or any other legal entity. Um, it it w would have to be accepted in total by the Parliament and the Council of Ministries, but in principle um, that means there is an opportunity, and th that's the stated objective as well, uh, they want to be able to immediately change the regulation according to innovations or developments in data, uh, in the data field. So they don't have to go around by writing a new set of rules, getting votes upon it, and then ultimately establish that as new rules. Uh, those are um, c a very concerning, generally very concerning elements. Now, what are the criti critical aspects? First of all, there is the general explicit opt-in across all media. Now, this has been already, that was the original proposal uh, before it was published and uh, the Commission itself, through some intensive talks right before Christmas uh, of uh, 2011, uh, changed the explicit, unlimited opt-in across all media because they realized that that is basically impossible to achieve because there wouldn't be any opportunity to go in and uh, ask for some uh, opt-in to start with, because if you don't have an opt-in, you can't ask for an opt-in. So at the end of the day, uh, you would have basically closed down all approaches by companies to any consumer, any customer. Uh, and it didn't exclude uh, business to business communication either. So at the end of the day, Somebody realistically obviously saw that this is impossible, so it needed some changes. But nevertheless, the objective of is now from a company and industry perspective that we achieve exceptions, exemptions within those opt-in uh, clauses. Now, that you should know that there is already um, within the e-privacy uh, rules in, in Europe, there is already an opt-in established, but the way the opt-in is obtained in all online or digital uh, media is relatively easily obtainable. Um, the second part, which still is around and is uh, highly controversial, is uh, regarding the identifiable personal data. Uh, is an IP address already a personal data or not? Um, there is the issue of cookies uh, that you I'm sure well aware of. Uh, and there is what is labeled online behavioral advertising. I've never heard by the way uh, that advertising would be non-behavioral. I mean, it's uh, a, a strange definition uh, because at the end of the day, you do communicate with somebody uh, to obtain an attitude, which normally obtains either a change or an awareness. But nevertheless, this is a very critical issue um, which is raised uh, through this regulation and it uh, therefore um, would make a lot of the what's called profiling uh, or targeting uh, activities almost impossible uh, if that would hold up. Now, 
the, there's going to be an increased level of bureaucracy despite the fact that the objective is to reduce the bureaucracy. Um, one reason is the requirements of storage that are needed to maintain the knowledge about those, which is the next level, uh, have chosen the right to be forgotten, which basically means um, it's a, a pet idea of the commission. Um, the right to be forgotten is that you as an individual can withdraw all information from one source, whatever that one source is. Now, if you are a company who has uh, in your CRM system, for instance, you have established uh, some facts and parameters on an individual. The idea is if that individual approaches you, you have to void that, uh, basically. But in order to be able to prove that you did, the only way you can do that is you actually keep it. Because otherwise you cannot prove that you actually do not use it, which is a totally different statement than the right to be forgotten. Uh, but that is not the worst part of the bureaucracy, uh, in my judgment. The next topic, which is data portability, in my uh, personal opinion, is probably the biggest individual threat uh, that this regulation carries. That basically m says that if an individual chooses to change a supplier, it can require that all information that is stored at that supplier to be transferred to the competition, which basically means you are at a bank, no, a bank is too easy. Uh, think about an insurance company. You are uh, a part, a customer of an insurance company and you decide that you want to have all information that is registered with that company to be transferred to another company. Why is bank? easier, bank has some special rules, and therefore uh, that's easy. The insurance has a special set of rules on health information. That probably is also a difference. But imagine any business that you're in, at the end of the day, you transfer all information, transactions, whatever happened uh, with that customer, you would have to pass on to the competition. Uh, I mean, this is, uh, um, this infringes on so many other elements like uh, right of ownership and ele elements like that. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, the commission uh, will be able to keep that uh, element within the uh, proposed regulation, but nevertheless, the thinking behind it is the thing that concerns me most. Lastly, um, there is something which I found uh, astonishing. Uh, I think it is an element of negotiability. Uh, that's why it's proposed in here. It's the level of sanctions that this regulation would propose. The level of sanctions of 2% of global turnover uh, basically means the, cur the current hardest sanction level that is existing in Europe is under the German uh, data protection law. It's 300,000 euros as a penalty for an infringement. Uh, this would mean that any company that has more than 15 million global turnover would have a higher sanction level to envisage than this rule already establishes. And if you think of some of the global 
players, this is big, big money we're talking about. Now, um, to a certain degree, um, I think this is uh, trying to put up the ante uh, so one can negotiate a different level of sanctions, uh, but that doesn't concern me as much as the fact that uh, why would global turnover be a measurement for an infringement in a European environment? Imagine you are a US-based company, you, are, you have worldwide sales, and about 10% of your sales are in Europe. Why the heck should you pay 2% on your global, on the other 90%? for sanctions uh, in any, in a, for a regulation in Europe. And that's where the approach to a global standard really starts to come up. The other element in there is the fact that if you are a manufacturer of games in the US, and you have one customer in France, this is the one that you have to establish as a procedure um, on data protection, which basically means the sanctions you would get is for one individual. It's as simple as that, at least as simple as that in the mind of the commission. Now, um, why am I standing here and tell you about those developments? I mean, first of all, there is a global implication in my judgment. Uh, moreover, however, um, I'm thinking about what we can do. Uh, we could either do this, and this is, by the way, sand, not the cloud. Uh, that would be the ability to, to, to look through something which would be quite amazing. Um, nevertheless, uh, I think the issue is much more, uh, or should we rather do something against that? And I think uh, what I'm trying to make you aware of is that every single industry, every single company that has business in Europe or intends to have business in Europe, in fact, will have to be aware of the threats of that regulation. And in fact, what I'm asking for is support for those uh, who lobby for changes in balance within that regulation, uh, which we are continuously uh, trying to do uh, with all the European DMAs and FEDMA and an institution that we have established in order to broaden the neutrality vis-a-vis -vis the political um, parties, and that is called the Data Industry Platform, uh, which is uh, an unstructured cooperation of interested companies uh, and associations. What we'll do there is we will collect st statistics of the data industry, which is, does not exist. Um, for good reasons. I mean, imagine your CRM system doesn't apply uh, to the new set of regulations or the set of regulations make it obsolete. I mean, it, it not necessarily would mean that you have to give up uh, your CRM system, but you would have to adapt it. And you know what it means if you want to change the software accordingly. Millions and millions of dollars. Now, those who are developing CRM systems probably may see that as an opportunity to make money, which I understand, which I applaud, but why wouldn't you rather do that for something in a non-regulated world where the creativity of a better structure is the force that gets you up uh, and running and doing better things? Um, I think there are uh, there is a little disappointment on my side because I am running now uh, FEDMA, the German um, DDV, uh, DMA, 
uh, as well as the data industry platform uh, for a year and a half, two years, almost two years now. And I am realizing that the hardest thing uh, and, uh, to achieve is actually awareness with the industry. Uh, most industry partners do kind of lay back and say, ah, wait a second, this will not come the way it, co it is set out, there will be changes. And if I ask how the, should those changes come about, they talk about their own strong lobbying arm that will work. Now, having talked to a lot of politicians in the European Commission as well as in the Parliament, and I know from um, the Ministry uh, Council um, that in principle uh, you don't trust the individual company. You always think that they're looking for their own profits. So you need the neutrality of a heterogeneously set up uh, structure that lobbies for the with the arguments and for a more balanced approach. There's nothing wrong with empowering consumers, uh, but there is also an important element of keeping the balance of the power of industry and commerce uh, so we can prosper as democracies. If there are any other things that you would like to know, uh, here is one block mentioned. I think you will be able to receive at the end all the presentations, so the elements that are on there are to your availability. And it's for me just to thank you very much uh, for your attention and hopefully some support in the future.